Imagine you are outside the universe. All around you is utter darkness, and far away in the distance is a dim light. As you approach it, the light grows brighter and closer. This is the clear light of tachyons emanating from the universe. As you penetrate the surface of the fourth dimension, the dim glow of the tachyons outside in the heavy black inverts to the third dimensional space-time continuum of filaments, walls, and voids of nebulae, galaxies, and clusters. As we approach one of the spiral galaxies, we soar through the stellar mist of its arms toward the purple glow in the center. This ultraviolet light is being pulled very rapidly into the black hole at the center, and as we pass through the event horizon, we enter a tachyon temporal singularity quantum tunnel into utter darkness. Far away in the distance is the dim tachyon glow of the gravitational singularity. One very all-encompassing theory is that our universe is inside of another universe, even larger than our own. There are several possible facets to be considered about this theory. One would be the nature of the connection between our local universe and an outside universe. That is, in particular, would it be a continuous connection, or would it be interrupted in some way different outside from within? One particular end of this argument I like to consider is the idea that our universe is the singularity inside a larger black hole. Of course, in the same way there is no evidence nor any way to collect any for either of the former contentions, so is there no way to test the latter. This would require direct experimentation upon tachyons, and this would require they be affected by some larger particle than themselves in the third dimension, while they are in the temporal fourth, existing as pure potential. On the other end of the spectrum, from the parental black hole, is the baby universe inside one of the black holes in our own local universe. It is thought, even though they are the same size as the electrical charge of an electron when it is struck by a photon, that it contains as much information as has been taken in by the black hole surrounding it, which makes it equivalent to the smallest conceptually possible miniature universe in itself. There are probably billions of these inside black holes all over the known universe, and science predicts these are where all of the atoms comprising us now will eventually end up. Between these two concepts at opposite ends in scope and scale, it is possible to consider the outer surface of the universe as a singularity covered in billions of singularities inside a much larger black hole. This little model is cute as a button. The truth, however, is less convenient. We have no way of knowing what it is really like outside our universe, aside from the fact that there are black holes in its surface and we think they go beyond. What we know of inside of this veil of the abyss is even more glum, since to all four corners the room is tiled and turned by time, which seems to be an invisible substance that we always desperately need more of than we have, and can never put a finger on without it changing. Time is only the fourth dimension, another one of the individual exponents comprised of a sum of exponents that is included as part of the total set of all universal dimensional exponents, with height, depth, and length, it is not alone either according to experimental physicists. There may be a number of dimensions, n, according to quantum mathematics done on computers, that define a hypothetical model of a universe similar to our own, and this number, as I have stated, is greater than infinity itself. 
therefore, if there is anything outside of our space-time universe, it might be so different that we would have no way of comprehending it in such a way that we could, for example, explain it to a child or program it into a machine to compute. It might involve extrapolations upon the ideal realms of algebra and geometry, just as black holes distort the more material laws of physics. If this were the case, we would have no more way of comprehending them than we do our emotions. In a black hole, the infinitely dense singularity is housed within an outer sphere of unsurpassable gravity called the Schwarzschild radius. Where this singularity is an absolute probability one event, the surrounding lightless, asymptotically infinite mass of the Schwarzschild radius that earns black holes their name serves as the absolute probability zero spherical well inside a boundary known as the event horizon. If the mind is seen as a singularity, then the brain itself is the Schwarzschild probability well, and just as inside the event horizon, the laws of physics, especially the gravitational force, are bent to the extent of inversion of the uncertainty principle underlying the parity of particle and wave. So, dreams, within the unconscious functioning of the brain, act as a vast network of symbolic wormholes uniquely and fundamentally randomly organized for individuals, but bound by universal laws of probability to effect necessary similarity. There are two categories structuring dream experience, which find their parity in the extra-singularity, intra-event horizon content of black holes. The first of these is governed by consumed substance and the innate characteristic patterns of organization thereof. Stimuli determined by psychological pursuit escape functions during the waking hours accumulates along lines of behaviorally reinforced memory recurrence. So, for black holes are the molecular, atomic, subatomic, and virtual particles consumed, the materials whose properties cause the patterns which arise therein. The second category is the more metaphysical and deals with the mystical accessing of information in dream states, the equivalent of which in black holes is the crossing of paths of the wormholes that arise built of the matter energy consumed. The evidence of the revelatory nature of reverie is the foundation of all human creation, but this revelation occurs only within a pre-existent physically ordered universe, rendering many of the most beautiful of human works to be merely discoveries of this fact. The experience of empathy itself derives from the sudden awareness that two lines of reasoning may share a common point. In a dream state, this is alike the perception of what Jung identified as the collective unconscious, or the awareness of symbolic ideas beyond the individual's accustomed scope of a more broadly applicable potential. The reflection of this in black holes is the overlapping of multiple strings of consumed substance forming sub-singular, similar, quantum mechanically atypical events, or, if you like, event bridges between wormholes of a fixed Aleph null dimensionality. A possible hypothesis based on these similarities is that consciousness inside a black hole is wormholes and unconsciousness entry of the singularity, or for Schrodinger's cat, consciousness equals negative one unconsciousness and unconsciousness equals pure negative one consciousness, where subconsciousness equals 
zero consciousness, zero unconsciousness. In the ten-dimensional consciousness model, this means that inversion occurs between the internal and the projected realms of consciousness, or between active consciousness and, by default, passive consciousness. This causes different changes to occur at different times in the functioning of the model. When the separation between active consciousness and true consciousness is as between a point on a sphere and the sphere itself, then the inversion is the second dimension. So here we see active consciousness acting as a carrier wave for true consciousness and thus consciousness in the projective state is like the wave of probability within the formal system, and this is what surrounds us like an aura. We must also remember that what we are seeing is not unlike the implosions of active consciousness in the fifth and ninth dimensions. Therefore, when it passes through a wormhole of dream in a black hole, consciousness inverts, or turns inside out as it enters the singularity. It then must invert back before it can emerge into a waking state again, as it would do in the mental black hole model, but not necessarily in a physical black hole. The black hole model itself, however, holds up nicely to the ten-dimensional mental model. The inversion that occurs for consciousness inside a black hole can be directly likened to the inversion which occurs at the full extent of the functioning of the active consciousness and the lowest extent of functioning for true consciousness through which the system can connect to itself and be cyclical. The positioning of these polarities relative to one another is indicative of the measuring of transverse waves such as comprise consciousness, rather than sinusoidal waves as comprise meaning. This is all thought to include itself in a basic suspension of Yalem, and it is also Yalem, which is hypothesized to be exposed in the singularities of black holes. Data passing through the surface of the event horizon inverts from below to above the speed of light. When it does this, it does not simply become tachyons with flat line vectors because of its proximity to the gravitational singularity at the center of the black hole. Instead, this additional gravitational force opens the tachyons up into wormholes by flattening the histories of their trajectories perpendicular to themselves. However, the tachyons still turn on their sides and tunnel through this, and therefore the ones that are not flattened into wormholes are pulled through these wormholes toward the singularity, and, in this way, continually divide, repeat, and replace themselves. The hyperspace which they measure, therefore, collapses into infinitely repeating halves, creating a quantum asymptote towards the clear light of the singularity. It is only those tachyons at the electromagnetic poles of the black hole's event horizon that escape when they are warped through wormholes. The number of tachyons that escape is thought to be as many in the straight electromagnetic field lines emitted from the poles in the gas jets as are absorbed on the surface of the black hole. This does not mean this is a great many number, because there are only as many particles being consumed at one time on the surface of the black hole's event horizon as there are wormholes that form in its electromagnetic field, and these are essentially identical in cause to the sunspots that appear on the sun. Whereas sunspots all represent electromagnetic bending outward away from the surface of the sun, the formation of wormholes on the event horizon surface of a black hole all bend inward. 
Inside, everything is infinitely divided, as I have described. However, all is perpetually passing through tachyon wormholes toward the central singularity. Just outside the Schwarzschild radius, there are only whirling photons shifted far into the ultraviolet range of the spectrum as they are pulled as fast as possible toward the surface of the black hole. Farther out than this is the accretion disk. All matter is converted into photons before reaching the surface of the black hole. When it penetrates this surface, it inverts to faster than the speed of light and becomes tachyon wormholes. Surrounding the electromagnetic equator of the black hole is the accretion disk of dust and gas clouds, stellar debris, and planetary matter. These can reach such sizes that they are visible for billions of light years and contain many billions and billions of stars that may shine for millions and millions of years. We know such massive clusters as flat or saucer galaxies that can be elliptical, spiral, or new and yet nebulous. We live in one such spiral galaxy, and because we can see the circumference of it outlined through the arc of the heavens on a clear night like a giant river of stars in the sky, we call it the Milky Way. The matter closer to the accretion disk orbits it faster than the matter further away, and this is what draws even the distant stars into the spiral path ever progressing towards their doom in a supermassive black hole at galactic core. Why galaxies form as flat, saucer-shaped circular planes is as much of an anomaly as why black holes, which consume all matter energy, would retain an electromagnetic field to cause this to occur. The explanation is that here we find the only necessary proof for the existence of tachyons as faster-than-photon electromagnetic radiation. Indeed, we see that it is tachyons that are produced by the electromagnetic field of the black hole in the perfectly flat history of their polar field lines emitted out into space along the iron gas jets of the black hole. By utilizing the technique of quantum tunneling through electron probability wells in the ionized iron, the microwave tachyons are actually traveling faster than light and are therefore flowing outward from the poles of the black hole faster than entropy itself, and therefore measure out to a distance the inside polar axis of a galactic electromagnetic field as large as the circumference of the entire body of stars, with field lines connected to every star's electromagnetic field, guiding them in their courses and gradually pulling them in. The gas jets of the black hole do not extend as far as the polar electromagnetic field lines project. They eventually dissipate into pre-stellar nebulae, rich in iron, other heavy metals, and complex carbon compounds ripe for the spark of nuclear fusion or the gravitational seeding of both solid and gaseous planets. The only problem with them providing all the necessities for creation in the universe is that they do not condense into a greater nebula cloud or belt, and because there is an insufficient amount of them over too great a quantity of time to provide a steady enough source for the duration necessary for nuclear fusion to randomly occur and trigger star birth. About the only useful things the gas jets of black holes do for the universe is replenish the background electromagnetic radiation with faster-than-light tachyons in the form of flat-line history field lines. These are themselves superstrings. The only reason that the quantum physicist researchers of superstring theory have failed to produce quantifiable results is that they have been looking for a universal phenomenon instead of one that only appears visible in certain rare cases.
the gas jets of black holes, is one such place. Here we see the tachyons tunneling from pole to pole of electron probability wells at such a rate that their repulsive force is inverted relative to particles greater in size and moving slower than it, thus causing them to be attractive gravitationally. This is not regular gravity, such as is derived from the tachyons emitted by the photons and the electromagnetic fields of stars and planets. This is the much stronger gravity of the pure tachyon, accelerated to an asymptotically flatline wavelength. The black hole is the sun of the sun, and has many similarities to the structure of all the stars in the known universe. It has a corona of ultraviolet radiation, a photosphere of tachyons and wormholes in which the differentially rotating, coiled up electromagnetic field lines pull radiation in instead of ejecting it, and where the sun has a plasma surface on an ignited gas cloud undergoing nuclear fusion the black hole contains infinite potential wormholes leading to a central singularity, a point of peace and clear light at the eye of a gravitational storm. All of these are as fundamental to the black hole as are their equivalents in an existing sun. As I have already described, the wormholes on the surface of the event horizon of the black hole occur for the same reason sunspots occur on the surface of the sun, due to the winding up of the electromagnetic field through differential rotation and the band jumping between points on two separate field lines that occurs. However, the wormholes of a black hole do not have counterpart pairs, as do sunspots. This is described as the weather of the black hole, or of the sun, just as the changes in pressure, temperature, and condensation in the atmosphere of the Earth are called its weather. Each of these forces causes the next. The pressure centers of the Earth begin by concentrations of radiation on the Earth deriving from the sun. The sunspot cycle of the sun is a function of its rotational position relative to galactic core. Therefore, each of these is only a kind of weather system within a larger weather system, or even like weather patterns in this system. This is an informational system that the ancients called the Akashic Records. They believed it underlies the realm accessed by dreams, subconscious and unconscious states, as well as altered, induced, or artificial states of consciousness. As I have described before, it forms a massive electromagnetic torus around every galaxy, containing a black hole at its core, and all of these are oriented relative to one another in the filaments, walls, and voids of the greater universe according to harmonic frequencies. It is believed that the quantum information units inside these orbs comprise the majority of the mass of the universe and therefore determine whether it will perpetually continue expanding or eventually collapse. However, this does not in itself explain how they would be interacting with one another to do so, since quantum information units would have to be being exchanged between them for them to be gravitationally drawn together. Because these enormous bubbles are made of invisible tachyons, it is most likely also invisible tachyons that are reaching out between them in the same way that, within the atmosphere of the Earth, it is pressure in that of the Sun, it is electromagnetism, and within a black hole, that of gravity, all of which are lesser dimensional reflections of the same force and substance as tachyons. The perimeter of the black hole that could be defined as its surface 
if it existed in any solid sense, is known as the event horizon. The measure of the distance from the singularity in the center of the black hole to the event horizon is known as the Schwarzschild radius. This measure can be determined by calculating the age of the singularity and the size of the black hole, which are directly related, where the speed of spin of the black hole is a function of its size or mass, and the age of the singularity is a measure of spin determined as a function of the speed of spin of the black hole. The only practical problem with measuring the Schwarzschild radius is that we do not have the speed of the photon to act as a fixed constant within the black hole, and therefore quantum physicists predict that space-time is warped asymptotically towards the singularity, and, as I have described, one effect is the infinitely repeating quantum halving of the tachyon wormholes, such that any measure that could be made even using the only possible existent constant inside the black hole, would be infinitely divided. Therefore, the equations may very well be able to provide predictions for the age of the black hole, and therefore a possible measure as to how distorted space-time outside into hyperspace the space-time inside the known mass of the black hole is, but these are only conjecture that cannot be properly tested. In truth, each of these baby universe singularities extends out into the tachyon halo surrounding our universe to form spiral history wormholes that pull all the further tachyon background radiation into them. These are the true time machines, for they penetrate the veil of photons upon which our picture of the universe rests to the present, current, and immediate moment, where the universe is a null void of random tachyons and supermassive black holes. Because the tachyon wormholes feeding the singularity inside the black hole and the tachyon radiation and singularity wormholes outside the universe are faster than the fastest visible form of electromagnetic radiation, the real particle photon, they may be considered null or negative energy. Not in the sense that they are negatively charged, such as the negative pole of a magnet, in the sense that, rather than give energy and contribute to entropy, they take energy out of the surrounding environment and create greater order. The optical illusion we often witness of any repeating cycle of moving items in a loop, that they seem to begin moving backwards, is actually caused by this effect occurring for tachyons. Their wavelength is so rapid that along a string of photons, they would actually be moving in the opposite direction than the photons. Thus, when we perceive the objects moving backward in a cycle, it is because of the microwave, tachyon processing inside our brains of our thoughts that we seem to see these images flow together and then move faster than themselves, such that their direction actually reverses. In the same way that the tachyons are traveling backward relative to the projection of photons in the continuum of entropy, they are also spinning in a way opposite to all other real and virtual particles. They involute, which not even the electron in its torus cloud shell does. The electron charge simply oscillates between poles in a differential orbit similar to the field of the sun, whereas the tachyon turns fully inward upon itself at one pole and warps through itself to emerge from its own other pole instantaneously. It follows a phi over pi spiral as it does this, making it very like DNA. It follows the same pattern around, 
other particle fields or wells at the same time that it tunnels through them. And it does all of this with spin that is opposite to that of those particle fields or wells, thus conserving their counterspin perfectly in a higher dimension. Inside the event horizon of the black hole, these tachyons are even further distorted by the presence of the rotating gravitational singularity, itself nothing more than a very old tachyon. The tachyons that are sliced and shuffled towards it into infinite halves as wormholes comprise a quantum foam very similar to that discovered by scientists to exist even in Hilbert space between the quantum information units where it is thought to be too small for any other such particle to exist. Their experiment was between two metal plates compressed together very tightly so that there was less than an atom's space between them, and their findings were that the dimensions themselves seemed to fracture in a wave form geometry similar to the structures created by masses of bubbles. Since it was the compressed spin comprising the surface of these quantum bubbles that could be measured, it was only their intersections that could be properly observed. However, it was not then known what smaller type of substance could comprise these vectors, since they were far too small to be electromagnetic and still fall into the known spectrum. The only explanation I can think of is, of course, tachyons. I have described the mechanism of tachyon tunneling before, however I will do so again, since it can also be related to the tunneling of other particles that has hitherto remained a mystery. Tachyons do not oscillate exclusively like electrons. They have two external opposite vectors that serve as dipolarity, just like the electromagnetic wavelength signature of an electron includes both the electrical wavelength and, perpendicularly, the magnetic wavelength. These two vectors encircle the surface of a probability well. When they reach one pole, they tunnel through to the other. Since these vectors are not isolated, as with the electrical charge of the electron in the three dimensions limited by entropy, information is moving through the tachyon at the same time as on the outside surface of the tachyon, and a smaller area is defined as the inside polar axis than that of the outside circumference. Thus, the tachyon tunnels through itself faster than it moves, and thus propagates itself in perpetual motion. Some quantum particles have been known to tunnel through others, or to exhibit tunneling-type behaviors. However, there is no known explanation. One such example is the photon in the double-slit experiment. Even when projected one at a time at a pair of slits cut in a solid material, photons will appear through both of them and cast light in a pattern as though coming through both slits. When particles are accelerated towards the speed of light, they tend to disintegrate into their smallest possible components, which tend to end their histories when they come in contact with other particles of equivalent sizes. These particles are called antimatter because of this quality. However, their other attribute of coming into reality through essentially temporal singularity tachyon wormholes is often overlooked. Here we see that the information, the spin measured in vector, holding these particles together, becomes increasingly inverted as it approaches the speed of light, until finally it reaches a point where it disintegrates under the existing laws of physics, and the particle breaks off into the constituent mutations. The factor holding tachyons together 
is that they are cohesively inverted from beginning as wormhole to end as gravitational singularity. Wormholes are formed on the surface of black holes and subdivide down into the central singularity, distorting space-time in an asymptotical well that jets out like a solar flare from the surface of the universe into the dimension of pure time and the dim glow of tachyons. The precession of the poles of the black hole traces an orbit for the singularity projected out into hyperspace, and this trajectory forms a supermassive wormhole, feeding all the other escaping tachyon radiation back into the universe through the black hole's poles. It is these tachyons outside the universe in hyperspace only that are the temporal singularities connecting wormholes inside one black hole to another as they constitute a continuum between the asymptotical projections of the singularities out into hyperspace from all the different black holes in the surface of space-time. This is known as the multiverse. There are temporal singularities in the third dimensional universe as well. Insofar as an event constitutes a temporal singularity, that is, such as if it is observed and remembered, then the entire universe can rightly be counted as being a huge temporal singularity comprised of infinite units of temporal singularity. There are also wormholes postulated by the special and general theories of relativity. However, none have been as of yet observed. It is true, however, that when a space shuttle carrying an atomic clock is orbiting the Earth, the atomic clock is moving faster than it would on Earth, and therefore one can predict that this effect could be increased asymptotically to the nth degree until time stopped as one entered a temporal singularity or wormhole and immediately found themselves displaced in the greater continuum. Look deep within yourself and you will find the singularity. It reflects the light that you let in and shines the brighter the more you look upon it. Some have called this inner flame the spark of life, some the ajna turned inward upon itself, or the non-clinging lotus blossom floating on pure consciousness. To know it is to know thyself. To know it is to know God. It is only a single facet of our concentration, the knowledge of that which we share with the universe. However, it is above and beyond all else radiant, calming, tranquil, and ideal. This entire universe is only one singularity. At the time of the Big Bang, the original singularity began to expand, forming our universe, which continues to expand to this day. The truth is that this singularity never expanded, and that we are nonetheless living inside of it right now. It is known that, in this universe, even the gravitational singularities inside black holes that are thought to contain baby universes are still the smallest quantum units in the entire known universe. Each one is, nonetheless, admitted to probably be about the same age as our universe. Therefore, it is only these very small things that comprise the size of the universe, and therefore the size of the entire universe is very small, only the size itself of one singularity. This is not because its inside is small, because here we are. This only means that its outside surface area is only comprised of the gravitational singularities inside it that project outward into time as far as anything that exists. 
Therefore, the difference between the inner area of three-dimensional space and the outer area of the fourth spatial dimension inside pure time is similar to an optical illusion or even a play on words. Let me try to explain it this way. The further out in space you go, the less space there is around you. The less space there is around you, the smaller space itself becomes. Finally, when you are free in time, the whole of space itself is as foreign and difficult to comprehend a concept as time is inside the three dimensions of space. Here, all you will find is a clear tachyon light. The fundamental geometry of the singularity is that it has no surface. If I haven't already obliterated enough beliefs, let me describe it this way. Imagine space-time as like a stained glass window, perhaps with an intricate pattern on it or something. Time would be the tachyon light passing through the window by which we can see the pattern on its surface. The singularity would be the surface of this light. Like the sun in the metaphor, the singularity would actually have more dimension than the depiction on the surface of the stained glass. However, since we are living in the continuum on that surface, this would remain relatively ineffable. A more accurate description might be to say that the singularity has infinite number of surfaces, or even transfinite, or even n number of dimensions, since we have already established that the multiverse of wormholes can potentially have n dimensions. However, if the multiverse were the unified field continuum of n dimensions, then it would only equal 1, and thus the singularity would only equal 0. This would be perfectly inverse to their fields of probability. Thus it equates to the spin of a gravitational singularity, which occurs around it rather than upon its surface, because it is surfaceless and comprised of the information of its spin alone. As I have stated, all singularities originate as temporal singularities. As such, they are without manifestation, transient, warping tachyons. It is only when they accumulate excess internal spin and begin slowing down and disrupting their internal polar axis spin that their external surface begins to produce phi trajectory offshoots of lesser wavelength tachyons as it slows down toward the inversion of matter energy at the fixed speed of light and in this way they generate centralized wells of gravity rather than unified force pull and become black holes. On a greater scale you could think of the black holes in the surface of space-time as also equivalent to the sunspots on the surface of the sun, except that, like the wormholes on their surfaces, they do not come in pairs, as do sunspots. They do, however, lead outside the universe in verse to the way solar flares and prominences eject material away from the surface of the sun. Their placement in the universe conveys temporary evidence of a much greater and more ethereal pattern of force at work. This greater, fourth-dimensional, holonomonic metaform would be equivalent to the differential rotation of time. The singularity projected out through the multiverse of tachyons into pure time opens up at the end into the clear light of the tachyons, emitting more that flow backward and, in this way, pulling more in and projecting them 
from the black hole's electromagnetic poles. It is an invisible brightness within a complete clarity, such as the external surface of hyperspace. It is the motion of these that is called time. Together they perform an effect similar to that of the superstring filaments and walls in the universal voids, the wormholes on black holes, the sunspots on stars, or pressure centers on planets, such as the weather in the dimension of pure information, always clear with highlights of ultra-luminosity. Laugh it up, Buddha. Yalam existed before the universe and will exist after it has disappeared. If we are a dream in the mind of Brahma that Kali destroys and that Shiva restores, then Yalem is the stuff such dreams are made of and the soul, mind, and brain of God. For such as are the dimensions beyond those of the sixth and those of the seventh. Still, all are one in the clear light of the singularity. It is as if no darkness could be imagined in the multiverse. Still the heaven of man is yet like the depths of hell to God. Not even is it to him like the earth is home to man, for to descend into it he must lower himself a long way. It is literally as much a fog or dream to him as would be for we the living, tiredness or sharp pain in a dream. I say this because I can imagine a heaven governed entirely by the will and law of the most perfect thoughts, ideas, and feelings of every living being, and yet I can still imagine a god that can imagine more than even all of this. Therefore, Outside of the dimension of pure information, there is a darkness of which absolutely nothing is known. It is here, beyond even the light of tachyons and the wormhole histories of singularities, that is the multiverse surface of hyperspace, on the other side of space-time, that we can say that yadhe vadhe exists. I have said that the movement of wormholes on the surface of hyperspace or black holes in space-time constitutes the pattern of time, whose movement is time itself. This is an effect occurring upon the body of God. God is, beyond this, ineffable, as though our universe were his heart and he were only his perception of it. However, I would prefer not to allude to such parables or anthropomorphication. While the surface of our universe might be a seething, writhing cauldron of bubbling baby universes, burning off the tachyon glow of only one singularity, if we depart the history of any one of the gravitational singularities inside this universe, we depart the outside surface of this universe and therefore find time to know God. Still, this is no good, for we are merely without the universe. It has been my personal experience that it was the parent universe that induced the motion of spin in the local universe that has led to the production of baby universes. This occurred due to a function similar to the parent universe slowing down and solidifying while the local universe sped up and became more ethereal. This would have been happening throughout the part of the history of the universe during which the stars of most of the visible galaxies were burning out, which would have happened long before we would stop seeing their light. As the universe was swallowed up into lighter tachyon radiation by the supermassive black holes, 
The darkness outside the tachyon multiverse, surface of the universal singularity, began to compress itself more around the little universe, which was eating itself down smaller and smaller while inside of it. Through the inversion of the speed of photons, it appeared, and continues to appear, to be expanding. This effect is no more an illusion than time itself, for such as are the same, the movement of the singularity, its gravitational spin. While the crown of thorns may have represented the pattern of ley lines which ancient geomancers had laid upon the surface of the earth to mark off karmic grid lines, a crown better fit for a king is the black hole model of consciousness. It shows us how the mind may be used as an exit from the confines of reality. This would make it actually more similar to the opium-soaked rag given to Christ on the cross to put him into a false state of death. While one is active and expanding, the other is passive and contracting. We all know the old saying about the more we learn, the more we know, and the more we know, the broader the mind is expanded. This is true for the brain, but the mind seems to be pushed and pulled and jostled about in all directions generally, and yet remain calm, centered, and at rest within itself. So let us, instead of giving credence to the saying, examine how the brain itself has been expanding, and only then, when we have done this, might we know the mind as apart from it. It is obvious to say that between an insect and a human, there is a difference in size between bodies, let alone brains, and the insect is the older species, and humanity the younger. Thus we could say that our brains had expanded quite a bit, however bigger brains aren't necessarily better, as evidenced with the dinosaurs, some of whose brains were about as big as a sumo wrestler, and about as plodding and single-minded, too. Humans have the benefit of a well-developed cerebellum, which acts inside the human nervous system in much the same way as pressure centers in the Earth's atmosphere, the sunspots in the sun's electromagnetic field, the gravitational wormholes of black holes, and the movements of singularities in hyperspace, causing the spin of the universal singularity, also known as the point of the Big Bang, or the inversion between the original nothingness and the present somethingness. This always hung over the dinosaurs' heads. They thought with their thalami, and were most fixedly intent on finding food, foraging, scavenging, preying on the weak and the lame. Their best skill was simultaneity, today known as manifestation or synchronicity, and still more popularly as coincidence. This consists merely in stalking, sneaking up on or happening upon something such as a source of food. They practiced this on this planet for millions of years, walked the lands right where we are today. The part of our brains that is similar to theirs, retains the inherent capacity for this skill, and our ability to project inference is a large part of religion. However, the columns and pillars of neural cellular gray matter of the cerebrum or cerebellum are far more complex than the holographic reflexive tissue of the thalami or thalamus. Here is where tachyons occur inside the brain, producing cascades of neural electric wave forms, thoughts, and emotions. On the other hand, producing cascades of the electrical current carrier neurotransmitter chemicals does not automatically induce inspiration 
only gives for it a fluid basis in which to arise potentially and through which to be propagated and subsist. Inspiration is that which comes from out of the blue, that is, from the ideal of free time. Also, inspiration comes from the right hemisphere, for it is inductive, as opposed to the functions of the left hemisphere, which are exclusively deductive. It is still possible for inspiration itself to become a distraction. It is represented as the third eye in many ancient cultures, including the Indian and Egyptian, where it can be turned either inward or outward. This polarity of inspiration-distraction is equivalent to active consciousness. Active consciousness expands. There are many theories that have developed since the time of Einstein's relativity equations attempting to unify the realms of mind and matter. Studies during the 20th century by Carl Gustav Jung and Wolfgang Pauli proposed that there may be two connecting principles acting in nature. One is causality, or the cause and effect principle, which operates in the fourth dimension of time. The other connecting principle is a-causal, and Jung called it synchronicity, believing it occurred at right angles in space-time to the other principle. More recent theories have proposed that it is actually information itself which is being transferred by both consciousness and material reality. The evidence is the increasing of order in the results of tests done on subjects for ESP when they were randomly resampled. Since information is the negative reciprocal of entropy, it would even go so far as to account for the potential for telekinesis, let alone John Bell's theorem that particles that were once in contact continue to influence each other instantaneously no matter how far apart they move, which would only require a meager acceptance of a faster-than-light mechanism for the transfer of energy. Experiments with remote viewing or long-distance telepathy show that there is a rise in right-on-target hits at the local sidereal times when the plane of the Earth is facing perpendicular to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, down the outer arm around 2 in the afternoon, and that it drops immediately to its lowest point when the Earth is aligned with the galaxy's core. To describe the human ability of precognition, Jack Sarfati uses the equation lowercase h equals parentheses e squared over lowercase h times c parentheses times parentheses m c squared over uppercase h, uppercase n squared, where lowercase h is Planck's constant, e is the electric charge of the electron, c is the speed of light, e squared over h c is the fine structure constant, m is the electron mass, uppercase h is the Hubble factor, 1 over t, where t is the age of our universe, and n is a number that will turn out to be the number of electrons in a coherent state of conscious superposition. Since a decoherence event affecting any one of the n coherent particles will decohere all of them, it is reasonable that T U is inversely proportional to N. This justifies the formula used by Jack Serfati 
TU equals 1 over uppercase H, uppercase N, for which, at present, 1 over uppercase H equals 10 to the 10th years, which is 10 billion years, at which time uppercase N will equal 10 to the 18th, so that to rough order of magnitude, TU equals 1 over uppercase H, uppercase N equals 3 times 10 to the 17th seconds per 10 to the 18th equals 0 0.3 seconds, which, as Jack Serfati notes, is close to the Crick brain frequency of 40 hertz based on his model in which uppercase T, lowercase grw equals 1 over uppercase H equals 4 times 10 to the 17th seconds. Tony Smith uses the same formulaic approach to extrapolate the potential for a conscious universe that can be known before its manifestations occur. He gives the long form of his equation as n to the second equals e squared over hc times mc squared over h times h equals e squared over hc times mc squared over h epl tpl equals e squared over hc times mc squared over epl times 1 over h over tpl where 1 over h over tpl equals the age of the universe as a number of Planck times 10 to the 7 plus 10 plus 43 equals 10 to the 60th Planck times mc squared over epl equals electron mass energy as fraction of Planck energy equals 10 to the negative 22nd. E squared over HC equals fine structure constant equals 10 to the negative second equals square of amplitude to emit photon probability to absorb a linking photon. The way he differs from Sarfati is to take as fundamental not 1 over uppercase H, but GRW decoherence. The total time for which N coherent particles can maintain superposition is uppercase T, lowercase GRW, over uppercase N. So he uses uppercase T, lowercase U equals uppercase T, lowercase GRW over uppercase n, and gets for the present time tu equals 3 times 10 to the 16th, divided by 10 to the 18th equals 0 0.03 seconds, which is shorter than the figure of Jack Serfati, but even closer to the Crick brain frequency of 40 hertz. So there may be resonant tuning of human consciousness with that of our present-day universe. The ancients said that awareness of all these types of things in all these types of ways was being in Kether. This is what I call the heaven of man that is hell to God. It has been proposed by some modern logicians that the root center of human consciousness is an impossible loop that is perpetually feeding information back on itself. This has been compared by Douglas Hofstadter to the saying of Zeno of Elia for the two-step impossible loop 
The following statement is true. The preceding statement is false. And the one step impossible loop. This statement is false. Both of which derived from an earlier Cretan saying, All Cretans are liars. I am a Cretan. Due to this fundamental foible of consciousness, information inverts when it enters the brain, and it inverts again when it enters the mind. This is just like the flipping of the image by the lenses of the eye, and its reordering in the visual cortex of the brain. It is typical of the level of redundancy with which we seem to cope. It is fair of the Jainists to believe our universe is being digested inside the many stomachs within the belly of a cosmic cow. The knowledge of this two-sidedness of ontology is fundamental to Taoist Zen Buddhism as well as to latter-day Western existentialism. Where existentialism gropes and moans over the quandaries and quagmires of the substance and motives of being, the Eastern school's array of meditative trances were designed to quell all such concerns and liberate the mind into the pure wonder of nothingness. Which is the dark and perverted, which the enlightened path, we exist to determine and to decide. However, we must also remember that all things are different from person to person. The best euphemism for the human condition that I've seen was actually given in a Hollywood movie called City Slickers. In it, Jack Palance's character, Curly, an old grisly cattle driver, explains to Billy Crystal's character, a New York Jew, that only one thing is important in everybody's life, and that it's what that one thing is that everybody is trying to figure out. This is the old, yet still effective, strategy of giving life the finger. Existentialism and Buddhism had gotten it pretty well figured out, as upon a gradated scale between the mind and the body, until Hollywood came along. Now, philosophers such as Noam Chomsky and Jean Baudrillard debate the imposition of the representational media on the minds of its consumers, and Hakeem Bey proposes a counterculture of immediatism in response. The question of what we are told in and about the information age we can believe, becomes needlessly complicated ontologically by hackers and corporate megalo-conglomerates, seeking to establish the terrain parameters of virtual reality. And so, when we ask, what is real, the question echoes in our mechanical ears and comes back in our artificial dreams to haunt us. The difference between an archetype and a stereotype is that an archetype is an archetype because they chose to be an archetype, whereas generic stereotypes are manufactured waste products of the pop culture simulacrum. Although the unwise fools are alarmed by the precedents the media have taken in recent times to such an extent that they fear for their churches and religious icons, these sort of listening and watching devices only represent an increase in the interest in electromagnetic fields and the return of my old perennial pals, the sunspots of Shem Ham for Ash. I believe, as do the Eastern schools of Tantra, Bhakti, and Karma Yoga instruct, that we, as free spirits, chose to incarnate into this existence, each within an individual purpose and that the reason we seek meaning in life is to better understand this purpose, and that we have meaning in our life only to the degree that we have such a purpose. 
nor do I believe we owe anyone at all any explanation whatever of what that purpose is or might be. I believe this purpose is God's gift to the individual and that free will is our guide when our eyes are open and morality is our guide when our eyes are shut. Both will lead us to the complete satisfactory fruition of our goal. However, virtual reality is only a simulacrum. The more manifest reality resembles the flexible parameters of virtual reality, the more it will be a simulacrum. This does not actually apply to a lot more than we think. After all, most of what the media have been used for is tactical video games, practicing strategies to advance agendas. These manipulations of the representational system reflect popular viewpoints and therefore walk about like archetypes, manifesting synchronous stereotypes in their artificial auras induced by the views of the aggregate consumer bases of the populace in their wakes, thus creating artificial karma, which can be followed independently of any of the players or even of the roles they play. This amounts to social consciousness or civic spirit. However, it remains entirely a construct of a representational system that constitutes safe pockets for the intersection of fact and fiction that are equivalent to a voting system based on a sort of karma that is, whether fact or fiction, in itself false in origin since its delivery mechanism is a machine. Let me specify again the difference between living gnomons and mechanical fractals. Imagine you were stacking a lot of ice cream cones. You would find that one fit into the other and that thus they take up less space packaging. This is like gnomonic replication. On the other hand, imagine you are stacking aluminum cans. These are cylindrical shaped and all the same size as one another. Therefore, none fit into any others and all must be stacked separately on top of one another. This is like fractal replication. Nice, crunchy, whole wheat grains of the ice cream waffle cone. Cold, hard metal wrapped in a paper pop art logo of the anonymous aluminum can. See what I mean? The strange thing is that, while the cells of the brain are stacked in columns like aluminum cans, thoughts propagate one right on top of the other, like so many ice cream cones. In this way also, the mind is and is not. Nothing permeates the mind. It is nothing that separates the mind from the highest knowledge, which, when it is perceived, is like nothing. The light of enlightenment is clear. It permeates the universe. It permeates ourselves. It permeates our cells. It permeates our souls. It is our free spirit. It is our free will. It is impossible for these things to be ours. Nothing is impossible when nothing needs done. All is a clear light inside of a darkness. We will all eventually let go. Time is the flow, inwards and outwards, until never it goes. The light that is what it is, is all there is, and it is the information of the spin of time. The mind is the singularity, inside the singularity. It forms when tachyons leap into existence in our brains, generating a pi spiral probability well electrical charge out of the phi spiral path of a temporal singularity. It exists for a moment, its flash fades, 
and then it goes. It arises like a voice pulled out of the nowhere to speak our minds to itself, with more or less passion, and then go on about whatever was its business in a relatively dreamlike way. The Easterners believe that the mind is more or less like the many different animals, and, in various ways, can therefore be put to work tilling over the great mill of the questions of reality, or even domesticated and made profoundly docile. In the West, it has been popular to equate the emotions with the weather, though only for the sake of those frightened by both. As I have described, the attainment of the fully functioning Atman awareness, also known as Christ Consciousness or Koran Zone, in the West, and simply as Buddhahood, Enlightenment, Nirvana, Samadhi, etc., in the East, are associated with the Eight Circuit Engram only to a degree determined by the free will. In the West, interest in the will equates Kundalini with a lightning strike. In the East, interest in the chakras equates divine inspiration with temptation. This is probably a sign of lunacy and madness. However, I don't believe in such things. It seems more likely to me that we are all the dreaming dreams themselves, dreams of the mind of God, in the mind of a dreaming God. This has always been a favorite of publishing quantum theorists, though for what reason I do not know. Take this as purely a thought experiment, since, of course, nowhere else but on the media screen has this ever happened, and even then, the plot was really lousy. Imagine an astronaut in a spacecraft orbiting a black hole who decides to go out and to take a walk around it. He, or she, gets out of the craft and floats over towards it, let's say, with a clock. They toss the clock in and watch as it slowly winds down and stops as it is turned into spaghetti inside the black hole. This part, the scientists are always sure to include. The same happens to the astronaut if they get too close to the black hole. Scary scientists. Trips are for kids. Now, come out of your pleasant little reverie, and instead of imagining lugging your cumbersome physical body around, just imagine your soul doing the job by projecting the electromagnetic aura of your astral body, or, if you are too lazy even for an out-of-body experience, let your geometric spirit or holy guardian angel take care of it for you. 23 Skidoo Imagine yourself a projected singularity, transported instantaneously to before a black hole. The sense of second sight alone is sufficient to allow you to view it in detail. However, creating a pictorial replica on a computer is equally easy. In this way, it is possible to enter into it without imagining the ridiculous consequences to your physical body since they are karmically irrelevant to one another. The only effects that I can describe are those that occur upon the mind, and, as I have already said, I do not believe in any form of madness. The mind may dissociate while the person is in altered states. However, it, along with the six fundamentals of reasoning and the free will, which are always there, locked within, trapped within the body, inside the brain, until there is no more neural electric activity in the brain of that person. The spirit is only pained when it is tried to be tamed. The soul is always free to go whichever way it wants to go. Our karma is bound to the garden of forking paths, but our self is the singularity of Tao. We may literally see all of this before our eye 
inside the tachyon wormholes of a black hole. This is equivalent to the sensation of a near-death experience, where we might see our life flash before our eyes and wonder, what did it all mean? And was it all worth it? The only baggage we bring into a black hole is the fourth dimensional emotional metaphors of the karmic histories of the spin of our relative form. And since we are using as our reflection a temporal singularity itself, we may choose to see the passage as it would rather than seeing what we think of ourselves reflected. Here we see that the perfectly straight rays of tachyons would be Swiss cheesed by a nebulous ambience, somewhat like cheap Hollywood smoke and mirrors. This is not exactly like a laser light show, nor is it necessarily like the gate to heaven. Like everything else that exists in the universe, it simply is what it is. Let me describe it a little further before it becomes too glamorized. We move about through situations that imitate our inner mentalities and ideations. Because we are accustomed to doing this, our alpha wave sleeping state gives us an ego in our imagination that reflects this attribute to an even greater degree. Sometimes I am forced to wonder, who is the real me? The me I am in my dreams, or the me that I am while awake. This is what life is like in the wormholes. Each wormhole leads to a different output pole of a black hole somewhere else in the universe. As you are pulled into the event horizon of a black hole, you will be sliced into infinite halves each of which warping through a series of all the black holes through the universe. However, your view will not change of a single, distant, clear light in the invisibly undulating darkness. Time becomes discontinuous, and the ego and the singularity gradually identify until there is an inversion. The inversion for consciousness inside a black hole is not waking up, as the dreamlike state of the wormholes might make it appear. Instead, the inversion would be the equivalent of going to sleep inside of a dream. As anyone who has ever gotten out of prison will tell you, things aren't that different over here from over there. This is about equivalent to the effects on the psychology caused by the distortion of time. That is, it is only what you have seen of the universe that can lower yourself, for there is nothing more beyond. However, entry into the multiverse, otherwise known as the heaven of man and the home of the angels, is only one more type of condemnation to a life blown by the winds of chance, destiny, faith, and karma, and cold comfort to Kurt Cobain's corpse. Entering into the multiverse of intra-black hole wormholes does not give one control over time. However, it does remove all concept of time. Thus, by liberating the soul from it, time is also being removed from its hands altogether. This is, according to legend, what differentiates between angels and the ascended dead, that is, the ability to continue to do good deeds towards the earth by re-entering it through the hypercube of time, or Kabbalah. When one enters a sleep-like state inside the dreamlike multiverse of tachyon wormholes, one's mind becomes lucid, and the will a clear light. If one is actually asleep and dreaming, 
the dream will answer more to the wishes of the dream self or dream ego. If you are imagining this while you are awake, such as, perhaps, right now, then you should see the entire history of a baby universe contained in the spin of the gravitational singularity. Here you are back again in the form of a stranger. This experience of meeting one's own higher power is one that should be even more highly recommended, for here is one of the elder tachyons, whose story is long and cyclical, and to say that this is not Yadevade, or a god of equivalent ontological concept, is to throw a stone at the stained glass window of space-time. For here is the very fire itself that burned and was not consumed, in the same way Brown's gas, a dioxy compound, can be used to generate extreme degrees of temperature entirely self-contained in a controlled flame, such as the acetylene torches used for welding that currently run off propane. After all, all singularities are really one and the same singularity only with a different face. This enlightened state of consciousness is equivalent to perceiving yourself as a temporal singularity, the electromagnetic aura of your astral soul as a geometric spirit comprised of luminous tachyons, which you have been doing all along for this thought experiment. Remember, though, that you are not God, you're just a portrait of God. As the Dalai Lama said, like a reflection of the moon on water, you are a shadow, you are an echo. To sleep, perchance to dream, said Hamlet. Aye, there's the rub. For in death we know not what dreams may come. We may visit our own graves as often as we want to in the end, but we will still be living. So these black holes are, for everything that exists now will eventually end up in them. They are the end of all history that record in fragments, the great canopic jars of the pharaonic mummies, or the earthenware jars in which were kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. The singularity in the dreamless sleep, for to stand at the central gravitational pull of a black hole and close one's eyes to the dream of the multiverse is to awaken to anti-consciousness, or to see through the eyes of otherness itself. What you see will be yourself, as seen through your own eyes. This is not a dream. It is the self you see. Otherwise, following along the wall into which the door of this final inversion cuts, one finds themselves out past the breath of the name of God and outside his holy altar. This is what you could call the throne of God, for it is only the back parts of that yet beyond us, and we are told that it is this part of God that we are made to see. Here we are neither dreaming nor sleeping, for we have left the wormholes in the singularity behind. Here there is nothing. This is where the lonely Kabbalists squat, eating Sumerian dust, spinning out their little spirals of gravitational black holes and weaving the multiverse of time into the fabric of the universe. The Kabbalah is merely equivalent to a regular engram in a living brain.